Stephanos, God of primal darkness. read about Manos, The Hands of Fate, in the Psychotronic Encyclopedia of Film, which was a compendium of bad and B-movies, and it just referred to this very strange, very weird little movie that was made by a fertilizer salesman in El Paso, Texas, back in the 60s. I'll get the, the luggage. We'll stay tonight and then tomorrow. You must be. You cannot stay. The master would not uh, approve. <laughs> Once in a while, you might find someone who claimed to have seen it, but by and large, it was just this very shadowy, very obscure little movie that hardly anyone had seen. Very low budget, independent picture that more or less seemed to have disappeared. It's a 16 millimeter. We used to call it the Hound Growl. And you kind of wake it up like this. You get up next to this guy, and there you go. Na, 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 na. We knew Hal Warren because he was an actor at Little Theater. We'd known him for a couple of years, but he was a he was a he was an actor. That was it. And was a nice enough guy. Didn't realize he was just fucking nuts. Just. Totally nuts. I mean, just wacko out. Because he was. He wanted to make this movie. And Al, he was a good guy, but he kind of bragged he directed. I don't think he'd, he may have seen somebody direct sometime or other. Al was an odd guy, but in a way, you could say like Ed Wood, another filmmaker who languished more or less in poverty and obscurity in his movies, he had a very distinctive vision. And he was absolutely single-mindedly dedicated to putting that vision onto film, and he succeeded. He was going to be the star, the director, the producer. Must be the master himself. And the energy that this guy had was incredible. Everybody got felt with this thing. I mean, everybody. He comes down and he says, We'll give you 6% of the movie and we'll give you 5%. That's 11%. Would you do it? I went, does that mean we get laid too? He says, yes, if you can get laid, that's okay too. I said, we're going to do it. Let's do it. And we did it. The first thing you notice is how obviously cheaply it was made. But beyond that, it's just not told in the way of a conventional Hollywood movie. There's something just very odd and bizarre about the whole environment, the whole setting and the characters and plot of the film. And it's just not like anything you've ever seen in a movie before. It's just not traditional Hollywood storytelling. Killing doesn't help anymore. You're all finished. Tom Diamond played the master, the arch-villain of the piece in Monos, the Hands of Fate. Afterwards, he moved out towards California and I think later to Pacific Northwest. Uh, pretty much adopted a hippie and bohemian kind of lifestyle and has pretty much wandered down that road to this very day. Neiman did a really nice job with what he was wearing. I mean, that was the set. He put it out like this, and these two set of hands are on there, just gorgeous hands on here, which is pretty legitimate. And he did uh, the full-length uh, self-portrait with him and the dog and the thing, which also looked really nice. Well, Jackie Jones was about seven years old when she played Debbie, the little girl in the movie. She would see the film that they'd brought back from the shoots, 
and just knew that this wasn't what a movie was supposed to look like. I mean, she'd seen Hollywood movies, and this was just not like that at all. Some of it would not look right, would not look in focus. It just was looked bad. And Hal would reassure her, said that, don't worry, we'll fix it all in the lab. And she'd think to herself, wow, movies really are magic. Please, Debbie, not now. John Reynolds played the part of Torgo. He was an incredible actor, a really good actor. Um, had problems, had some really serious problems. Uh, Jackie Jones, who played the little girl in the movie, remembered he was being all kinds of fun on the set, and in later years realized it was probably because he was high on something all the time. I don't know how many months afterwards, but he blew his brains out. Poor guy. Um, that was a shame. Because the guy was good, he really was. He was a nice guy, too. And was one of the better over-actors I'd seen. Basically, the, the roles everybody had, uh, everybody had like 19 roles on everything. And I basically did camera, assistant camera. Then I wound up doing grip, lighting, uh, costuming, first camera, uh, 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 sometimes makeup, second camera, definitely an assistant director, definitely an assistant director. Um, what else did we do? Well, Bernie started out as the stunt coordinator I know he was real unhappy with one shot where he went r rolling off the side of a cliff and down the cliff, and you basically just saw him go rolling over the edge of the cliff and disappear from view. You didn't see any of his spectacular stunt. I can't go on. Take Debbie and run. And he became an actor in the film because one of the girls that was cast in the movie is one of the brides of the master broke her foot during the shooting, and so they arranged a scene where... She and Bernie were a couple of kids sitting in a car making out from, from the night into the dawn, as it turns out. She always got Bernie a big ovation. We just, you know, licked our tonsils out there like crazy out there. So we get that part done. And we go to the east part of town, to Cobra Colwell's ranch, to shoot everything else we had. They were looking for somewhere out in the country. But I don't remember just how they knew about it. I... It's kind of out of the way places, you'll agree. They used the house over over behind those trees over there to shoot some indoor scenes, and they brought in a bunch of dirt for some reason. Like, that was I that was where this queer sort of man was supposedly lived, and they, she slept on the dirt. So I had to, after they left, I had to get the dirt hauled out. Of I don't think they had a real story to start with much. Uh, so, that was about it. Well, in the screenplay, the women, the brides of the master, were described as wearing these very diaphanous outfits. So, apparently, you're supposed to be pretty sheer and see through. They show up, they have white panties on from here to here. Something like you did in 1955. You know what I mean? I said, no, it's this. Some kind of a bikini thing. Come on, guys. Jesus, let's get this thing together. Come on. We're not saying take your clothes off. Come on. Not going to happen. Was not going to happen. Then when we saw the bra, it looked like something that happened in 1953. You know what I mean? With the tits that come out like this. Stiff, hard. You know what I mean? That's what they wore. I mean, that's not sexy. That's not anything. That's horrible. They ended up wearing what looked almost just like... Oh, big girdles and sports bras in a way with some kind of sheer gown over that. And no, no, it's more like watching your mom getting dressed or something than watching anything too hyper erotic. I uh, was asked by Hal, I said, you know, we need to have a fight scene. Can you help us stage this fight scene? I said, yeah, that'd be really easy to do. I said, well, show the girls how to do this, so they'll get hurt. And I said, I'm going to direct this goddamn fight scene. I don't care what anybody says. So I said to one of the guys, well, can I, can I grab her here? I said, sure. It's okay to touch somebody like this. You're fighting together each other. So it's okay. You can't just do this. you got to be able to do this and grab. You're going to grab behind the, behind the head or behind, go, go back and do a thing like this. You know, just do it. Just do it. Just do it. So we watched this thing. These gals got with the program. They looked like they were hurting themselves. 
They really were, but they weren't. And the ones who didn't do anything got hurt. <laughs> they came back in the second weekend, elbows tied up, this tied up, everything tied up. It was just ridiculous. One of the weekends we couldn't do it. Just have them couldn't walk. It's really late. It's really late. I got to Hell and Growl 16. I am laying down on the table, right? And the scene is the girls come in and bang and smash and do this craziness, right? So I'm laying down. Next thing I know, they're grabbing my balls. They're grabbing my dick back and forth. So I'm sitting here saying, what are you doing to my balls? Ah, ah. And I started moving the camera. That's how the camera moved. Like that, I couldn't get out of the way. That's why someone went out of focus. Because I was moving, I was getting out of the way. <laughs> This is everything was here, you know. Everything was here. Uh, let me put the little girl in here. Because it was the shortest one there. How long I thought that was brilliant. I thought that was brilliant. They're standing on here, around here. One hand goes around here, the hand goes around here like this. I'm going, no, 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 no. Six, five weeks, three weeks into the thing, we're having a party one night. We said, by the way, what percentage is you? Do you have the thing? Well, what's your percentage? Well, what's your percentage? Well, we got 150% real quick. And we knew that there were lots of other people who put real money into it. So we figured about 300% out there. But was going to get it done because we have a, a commitment to do this. And these other people really wanted to do it. We really wanted to do it as well. But it took it really difficult to deal with this guy. Everybody wanted to leave at one time or another. Several people wanted to leave several times. Because Howard's driving me crazy. Just nuts. There's quite a bit of tension on the set. They were working their day jobs and then going and shooting all night doing this. And just tempers would flare. Uh, Hal was, I guess, a little prima donna, the director, star, producer of the film, the Orson Welles on the set. Everybody was always into it until about 10 o'clock. And then it got a little old. And then by 1 o'clock, it got real, it got real old. It got real old. Because we were all ready to do it. And then we'd wait for this, and wait for this, and wait. And I said, what are we waiting for? Well, we're waiting for the... I said, what, the, what are you waiting for? We've been here a half hour. Come on, man. Dressed and ready. Lights are ready. Come on. I want to be alone for a moment before I start. This is Hal. I said, okay, Hal. No problem. Give us the high sign, Hal. And he would walk over and... What did you go into it? We start laughing. Let's go, God. Wait a minute. Start this again. Back this thing up again and do it again. You look like a jerk. Bring it back and do it again. <laughs> 
And so we used, to, we used to give him a hard time because he used to give us a hard time. And Hal got really upset. We put his hands in Hal, you're going to have to learn how to live with this a little bit. I said, you can't, you can't be straight about this whole thing. You just can't. He says, I'm not going to let you do that. I'm not going to let you do that. So the rest of the people are working on this thing really, really hard. And he worked that hard. I thought the guy was going to have a heart attack. I really did. We figured he could have either an aneurysm or just an upfront stroke. And that we would just we would just finish the movie off without him and change the and kind of change it a little bit. And we used to tease him all the time about that. shot that the room is very long though. We're up against the wall like this. But you know there's, there's room from here to here to the, to the window. I mean you know it's, I don't understand that part. I thought it was smaller. Much smaller. When he steps down and shuts the door, the top of the door is about here. Because he steps down. Hal uh, steps down and says I'm the master or whatever I can't remember what the line was. But that's the front door over there. I am Michael. I take care of the place while the master is away. What do you think? So you can, you're pretty sure though that it was all shot in this place then? Oh yeah. The film had what you could only describe as a disastrous premiere at the Capri Theater in downtown El Paso. And this was a big deal for El Paso. I mean, serious deal in El Paso. The mayor was there, the son, everybody was there, everybody sitting down about tuxedos and stuff. Hal Warren, the cheap bastard that he was, rented a 1953 Cadillac, black. This Cadillac limousine would pull up in front of the theater and disgorge a couple of the stars of the movie who would step out and then it would drive off. And we were around the corner and the entire everybody went in four at a time. And then it would come around, pick them up again, go in there, go around, come again. And they'd have that go around, load up, go around the block and drop them off and made it look like a lot of limousines were bringing a lot of people. That was pretty tricky. Because they could really only afford the rental for the one limo. Then we knew, we knew right away that we were in trouble. But you we, know were, we, we were just in deep doo-doo right away. We knew that. Well, listen, I've never gotten us lost before. So we sit down, the mayor doesn't follow it on the bullshit back and forth, sit down. Waiting for the movie. It's, I mean, we're like holding our breath. But no one had seen this. I mean, it was like, oh, didn't know what to, yeah, how bad could it look? I mean, how bad could it be? And then all of a sudden, boom, it starts. Like this. 
Sound of Tony Dark like this, huh? Yes, my dear, I still like you very much. Can we go in park on it? It was crazy. You couldn't hear anything. It was just nuts. And they're standing on top of the hill. I'm going, this is the beginning of this. This could not happen this way. Please, God, don't let it be this bad. Please don't. And he comes in, he pulls and he stops. And they begin talking. How many times do we have to chase you kids? Oh, she. Holy cow. Man. And it's kind of like, hello? I think we're doing something Where are you? Wrong. Okay. I'm going, what is this? Why don't you guys leave us alone? As soon as any of the characters opened their mouth and the dialogue came out, you just heard people in the audience snickering. And soon there were just, I guess, gales of not very appreciative laughter. We got smaller and smaller and smaller. By the time 35 minutes was in this thing, everybody was screaming. I mean, screaming at the top of their voice. It was hysterical. It was hysterical. The cast and crew were just like slinking down to their seats. I think some of them snuck out of the theater before the end rather than face, you know, the humiliation of being seen by the audience afterwards. Uh, I was a little embarrassed. A little embarrassed. We uh, kind of, like we were taking a cigarette break or something, and just kept right on walking, you know. And five years ago, seven years ago, we get a phone call. Were you in the movie so-and-so? I went, huh, who are you? So the guy starts talking about Manos, and like, it's a big deal. I said, it's a big deal. So we're singing over Sonia Life, man, what do you mean, a big deal? Oh no, oh no, you don't seem to understand. It was discovered by the Mystery Science Theater 3000 people, and they pretty much did just that, held it up as a comedy, or at least made a comedy of it. Well, made fun of it, really. And then we got phone calls six months more later, and then a year later, more, more phone calls, more phone calls. And then I finally realized, that this thing was so bad. We all knew that, but we didn't know that everybody else knew that. Then it found a huge cult audience. The audience just embraced its badness and the weirdness of its characters. Torgo just became a big popular character with his own huge fan base. And in its weird way, the movie survived in a time when most of the movies ever made have just disappeared and been lost forever. up to its reputation. It ranks right up there with like Plan 9 from Outer Space. Oh, there it is. I've seen the worst movie ever made. It's like, like an ugly dog, you know. You gotta love it. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's pretty bad. You just couldn't.
And that was the whole thing that made it funny. It was embarrassing. God was embarrassing. I mean, really embarrassing. And I don't know, I mean, I don't know what to say. But we had a good time, though, we really did. That's the thing I wanted, I wanted to make people to understand. People, these people had a great time, man. Just a great time. Don't forget the silly way we met. Don't forget the tender touch that set fire burning in two. But I'm forgetting you. Thy will is done. Thank you.